Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining. My name is Harry Higgs, and I'm an application engineer here at Guideline Geo. And my background is working as an applied near surface geophysicist in the engineering and ground investigation sector in the UK. Uh, first, a word about the company Guideline Geo design and manufacture ground penetrating radar instruments under the Marla brand and seismic resistivity and TEM instruments under the ABRAM brand. The office, the office has a global reach through both local offices and a network of distributors covering more than 80 countries. There are 90 employees worldwide working together with our distributors and other partners to service our customers. Here's the location of our offices. Our manufacturing is based in Malo in Northern Sweden. Our product development is centered in nearby Umeå and our head office is in Stockholm. And I myself am based near to Manchester in the UK. So Abram as a company was founded in 1923. Marla was founded 14 years later in 1937. And here is a list of some of the GPR, resistivity, seismic, and more recently 10 products released over the years. In 2013, Marla and ABEM were brought together under the guideline Geo banner, but maintaining the individual branding of both Marla and ABEM. So welcome again to the webinar. It's an introduction to the MASW method. The objective is to introduce what MASW is, why it is useful and how to apply the method. This will cover some important concepts, practical aspects and discuss some case studies. So firstly, what is MASW? It's an acronym for the Multi-Channel Analysis of Surface Waves. MASW is able to image a phenomenon of surface waves known as dispersion. And using inversion methods, we're able to reconstruct the shear wave structure of the Earth. So understanding the shear wave velocity structure of the Earth is incredibly useful as the rate of shear wave propagation is closely linked to how the ground deforms and responds to different stresses. Each of these elastic moduli shown here explain different aspects about how the ground changes in response to stress. There are different ways to determine elastic properties from in-situ geotechnical tests to laboratory testing. However, because these moduli are all related by seismic wave velocity, it is also possible to use seismic methods like MASW to determine them. And uh, just have a quick look at the history and development of the method. So the origins of surface wave applications in engineering go back as far as the mid 20th century where scientists sought to investigate the as yet unknown influence of traffic vibrations on the lifespan of roads. So by measuring the velocity of the waves at different frequencies, they were able to determine the elastic properties of the different materials present in the road construction. These experiments were achieved just using one receiver, a purpose-built shaker, and an oscilloscope. And in 1982, researchers introduced a two-receiver approach, which would later be known as the spectral analysis of surface waves, and innovations in microprocessing and the fast Fourier transform algorithm allowed for frequency spectrum analysis as a quick and easy way to evaluate the propagation of elastic waves through layered media. And in 1987, a 24-channel acquisition system was used to image higher modes. The 1980s were really the infancy of multi-channel measurements. And then modern methods of MASW developed in the 1990s are born largely out of work done at the Kansas Geological Survey, and they led to widespread adoption by the civil engineering community. Iterations in digital seismographs over recent years, along with development of new and more advanced processing methods and investigation methods, allow users to increasingly understand near surface with greater confidence. So what are the typical uses for modern MSW methods? Uh, VS30 in Europe or VS100 in, in the United States relates to seismic site classification which is recognized by the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, NEHRP, 
In short, shear wave studies are used to inform building design and mitigate the risk from earthquakes. Assessment of bedrock and bedrock quality is important in construction. For example, knowing the mechanical strength of the ground may help designers to determine if bedrock they want to remove can be excavated using mechanical ripping machines or not. And elastic estimates for elastic moduli may be determined from MASW, and this allows engineers to more efficiently design foundations, for example, when building wind farms, along with many other uses. So Rayleigh waves are the focus of this webinar. There are many other approaches to surface wave analysis, including those that utilize Love or Schultz waves. These and their applications are outlined in the further reading section at the end of this presentation. Surface waves are generated in the presence of a free boundary layer, for example, at the surface of the earth, and they move parallel to the surface. Rayleigh waves have an elliptical retrograde motion, and they're comprised of a mixture of primary and vertical shear motion. These are fast attenuating waves and they propagate much shorter distances through the near surface than the primary and the, and the shear body waves. Uh, particles are both deformed and displaced during wave propagation. Surface waves are dispersive, meaning that the waves split into discrete packets of energy that propagate at depth ranges that are dependent on the wavelength. The velocity of the wave depends on the elastic properties of the material through which it travels. As a result, velocity, frequency and wavelength are all related through surface wave analysis. We use these physical properties to inform us on the structure of the ground. The MSW method utilizes an array of geophones connected to a seismograph, and then shots are made at a series of known locations. Delay times between signal generation and arrival at each geophone are calculated by integrating a triggering mechanism which activates the seismograph at the same time that the shot is made. The presence of many receivers, usually arranged in a linear array at equal spacing, allow a whole range of Rayleigh waves of different frequencies to be resolved. The shortest wavelength the array can theoretically image is controlled by the distance between geophones and the longest wavelength by the total length of the array. Distance between source and receivers is chosen to minimize what we call near and far field effects and to ensure as much useful signal is recorded as possible. Uh, we will look at some of these parameters in more detail as the presentation continues. So when a shot is made, primary and shear body waves spread out in the hemisphere beneath the ground, and the primary wave travels fastest, and the shear wave follows behind. Surface waves are generated by interactions between primary and vertical shear energy and propagate slightly slower and move parallel to the ground surface. The seismograph records very small voltages that are induced into the geophones by the seismic event and presents the data as a series of vertical adjacent traces with one for each channel. Amplitudes are then proportional to the voltage induced by the wave. We then compress the state set and increase the scaling factor. We can look closely at the waves that are visible. In this example, the shot position is eight and a half meters left of the first trace. The direct and refracted pressure waves are shown in blue, and they are the first waves to arrive from the source uh, and arrive at the geophones. Then we have an air wave shown in red, and then the ground roll containing the surface waves, primarily Rayleigh waves, are shown in purple. These are more difficult to interpret from the time distance data as they contain both slow and fast moving waves. And then in green, we have the ambient noise which occurs both before and after the signal from the source. This noise that you can see in, in the shot record here was primarily due to the drill rig that can be seen on the photo a couple of hundred meters away from the shot location. Although having said that, it did not present, prevent the um, imaging of clear dispersion curve in this case. So the, the vehicle for imaging MASW data is the time and space wave field transformation. This is in effect a two-dimensional Fourier transform which decomposes the time distance data into frequency and velocity data. 
phase velocities are separated by frequency and amplitudes are represented by color. Uh, so in the, in the picture you can see here, the reds indicate the highs and violets the low amplitudes. As a result, energy in the signal clearly plots the velocity and frequency of the dispersion or the dispersive radio waves. This image is produced using the phase shift method, but it's possible to extract dispersion through other transformations also. It's then possible to extract the dispersion curve digitally by interpreting the highest amplitudes along the fundamental mode dispersion curve, which is also known as the M0 curve. Note also that the higher modes may also be present, and for accurate analysis, it's useful if you can differentiate between those. So once the dispersion curve has been interpreted, extracted data can be carried forwards to inversion, with the result being a one-dimensional layered model of the subsurface. In the model shown, the blocky blue line denotes the modeled result. However, it is also common to export data in numerical formats for further analysis. And if multiple dispersions are calculated, then data can be combined to create a two-dimensional representation of the shear structure of the ground using interpolation. Uh, so in terms of data collection methods, the most, the most simple array is a fixed array with one or a few off-end shot positions. The result from this is a single one-dimensional model, which is centered in the middle of the array, and it represents an average of the ground conditions beneath the array. This method is popular for VS30 surveys, but for results to be accurate, it assumes that layers are horizontal, and that there is little or no horizontal change in the shear wave velocity below the array. Another type of fixed array would be to have many shot positions located throughout the array. And then by processing the data using the common midpoint cross correlation method, it's then possible to derive multiple one dimensional models and interpolate the results into a two dimensional profile. This is a popular approach due to the benefits of the CMPCC method, uh, such as lateral resolution. However, care must be taken during the data processing not to bias the result with near or far field effects. We also have roll along methods. Um, this uses a constant source to receiver offset. And for each new station, both the source and the receivers are moved by the same amount. This method is popular for covering a large areas of ground, and when used with a seismic streamer, this method is time efficient. Note that this will produce a single one-dimensional model for each shot and receiver position, with the one-dimensional model again located in the center of each array, where models are then interpolated to create 2D representations of the subsurface. And that's a picture of a streamer. The other method uh, is of roll along is to use a fixed array and a shoot through approach. So in this example, there's 24 geophone arrays that are used. And each time a roll along is undertaken, the array is advanced by 12 geophone positions. And then using standard MASW processing techniques, it'd then be possible to select 12 channels for each source position. And as the source moves forwards, the 12 active geophones also move forwards by the same distance to maintain a fixed offset between the source and the receivers. And this creates a new midpoint for the one dimensional model at each source and receiver move up. And, and in this uh, image that you're seeing, this is a kind of top down approach. Where, you, where we stack the, the record numbers on the vertical axis and then the distance along the profile on the horizontal axis. And then the, the blue dots represent the source positions. So for every shot record, the source position, as you can see, is moving up. And then the particular active geophones for that source position um, 
are then selected during the processing stage. Uh, we then also have passive arrays. So rather than using an artificial seismic source with a known time and location of occurrence, it is also possible to instead use a passive array for data collection. And these make use of traffic and ambient sources of, of uh, seismic signals with much longer wavelengths. And because of this, they're able to image much deeper into the Earth. However, because the source locations are unknown in passive data, the use of two-dimensional arrays allows waves from different incoming directions to be imaged. Typically, data may be collected in a series of long records, for example, 15 to 20 one-minute records, which are then combined and analyzed together. Active and passive methods are useful for different depths of investigation and typically require different geophones, array shapes, data collection and processing. However, the two data sets can be processed and combined using most commercially available software into a single shear velocity profile with both shallow and deep data complemented by the two uh, data collection methods. When undertaking active surveys, source offsets should be designed to avoid near and far field effects. The Rayleigh wave takes a certain distance to develop into a coherent wavefront of both primary and shear vertical energy. If receivers are placed too close to the source, then the resulting dispersion curve may be biased towards lower velocities. Uh, as you can see from this example here, because of this, it is common to choose a source offset of between 25 and 50% of the receiver array length. Far field effects occur when the body wave energy overtakes the Rayleigh wave energy in amplitude. These effects can be mitigated by using large enough source for the spread length and site conditions encountered. Uh, typically, a large hammer source will provide enough useful Rayleigh signal for around 50 meters in urban environments and 100 meters in low ambient noise environments. The receiver spread length is approximately equal to the longest resolvable wavelength that can be measured. The investigation depth is in turn equal to approximately half of the spread length. The receiver spacing relates to the shortest wavelength resolvable by the array, and this in turn determines the minimum depth of testing, usually between one third and one times the receiver spacing. Rayleigh wave detection commonly uses vertically polarized geophones. Spiked are suitable for soft ground and often give the best coupling possible. Tripods can be used on hard surfaces. And geophones, as we've seen, can be fixed into streamers for tow surveys. Generally, four and a half hertz geophones perform better than 10 hertz over a range of ground conditions when used with a hammer source. Streamers also tend to perform well for MASW surveys. Passive surveys may utilize lower frequency geophones from one to a few hertz. Sledgehammer sources are cost effective and quick to deploy. It has a good, it has a relatively good proportion of ground roll energy, and using a polyurethane hard plastic strike plate will provide a better low frequency content pulse than a traditional metal plate. The buffalo gun uses shotgun shells to create a small explosion with the barrel of the unit pushed into the ground. These are lightweight and portable units but much slower in acquisition than hammer sources. And here's just a quick comparison I made between some data I collected using both a hammer and a buffalo gun in clay ground. Um, as you can see from the kind of mean testing depths that the, the buffalo gun performs slightly better in both the minimum and maximum test depths, but it also took over three times as long to collect uh, the data 
and it required two operators for the Buffalo gun compared to just one for the hammer. And then powered weight drops, they can also be used to increase the testing depth. However, the gains may be incremental as a greater proportion of the energy may be converted to body waves rather than ground roll, as shown by the graph at the top. So the best method for deep acquisition is often passive data collection. And here are a few procedures that will help to keep things from getting messy on site and ensure the best data collection possible. Keeping cables to one side of the array helps to prevent trip hazards and allows the source to be moved along the other side without getting tangled. Receivers and sources need to be as well coupled to the ground as possible to ensure the signal can be transmitted with as little loss in energy as possible. Wind and rain can act as a significant noise within a shot record, so it can help to bury or place weighted pots on top of them when the weather is born. And pre-triggers can set the amount, uh, record a set amount of data prior to the shot triggering and seismic, uh, oh, sorry, on the seismograph and allows users to assess the repeatability of the source, which is good for quality control. And lastly, areas of standing water or soft ground can cause poor coupling between the geophone and the ground resulting in poor signal transmission. So where possible, it's always good to avoid such areas when planning where to place an array. So some of the limitations that we have with uh, these surface wave methods, um, or should I say MSW, um, the, the correct application of the MSW methods can be complex, so experience is important from survey design through to the processing and interpretation of the data sets. A small scale stress and strain where materials obey Hooke's law is assumed for calculations of elastic moduli. In laterally heterogeneous geology, errors may be introduced as velocity is averaged beneath the array and over the receivers used to calculate a particular frequency. So CMPCC methods can be used to increase the lateral resolution by using different receiver pairs grouped into common midpoints throughout an array. Higher modes may become dominant in situations um, uh, where you have a sharp velocity contrast at, at shallow depths. For example, in this dispersion image, shown uh, there is, um, uh, which was collected in ground with shallow mineralized bedrock you can see there's a sharp discontinuity in the curve which may be the result of higher mode superposition and then estimation of shear and shear wave velocity profiles requires solving of an inverse problem in which alternative models provide an equal measure of fit and therefore an understanding of the modeling process and geologically plausible solutions, as well as the limitations of the method itself, will allow a user to constrain a model or a class of models, which are most likely. And then MSW performs well over relatively flat or constantly sloping ground. However, the gener generation of shear waves would be hindered in situations where the ground undulates significantly across the array. And of course, there are more limitations to consider, for example, 3D effects resolution and spatial aliasing, um, near and far field effects as well. And so the literature presented at the end of the PowerPoint will help to provide a more comprehensive and detailed discussion. So the active processing workflow, the aim with this is to set out a repeatable and reliable procedure for turning your raw data into final shear wave velocity sections. Uh, so step one would be to load the data into the software and if multiple shots were required, most software should allow the user to integrate multiple data sets into the working project. Step two would be to review the data and update any of the geometry settings. If using a fixed array and you want to use the CMPCC method, you should then calculate this once the geometry has been assigned, otherwise it can be skipped. 
Then we want to select our dispersion parameters. This is the velocity and frequency window you want to calculate the spectrum for, and then calculate those dispersion curves. Once, they, once they've been calculated, we can then pick, pick the dispersion curves and then enter the inversion parameters and run the inversion. And then following that, choose our final models that we want to present. And then in terms of interpretation, well, there are published velocity tables for different geology types, but the velocity can also indicate the state of the rock. So weak, poor quality rock will have a lower velocity than solid, unweathered bedrock. As this table shows, uh, with large overlap between materials, velocities are not unique to a given geology or structural state, and good interpretations will include other sources of information, such as geological maps, borehole logs, or other geophysical data sets. Interpretation may also be made by classifying ranges of velocities, for example, in VS30, where certain ranges of uh, S-wave velocity relate to a certain classification of the site. And that brings us on to a couple of case studies. So this first one is on wind farms. And the background would be that during the turbine life cycle, there's constantly changing pressures due to the wind, which are exerted through the structure of the turbine and into the foundations. This gives rise to dynamic stresses, both accurate and cost-effective understanding of the ground and its engineering parameters prior to construction are required. And the more confidently these engineering parameters can be established, the more safe and materially efficient foundations can be designed as a result. So MSW is a tried, tested and accepted seismic method of determining dynamic estimates of shear velocity, which are closely linked to dynamic estimates of ground engineering parameters, often re referred to as the dynamic elastic modular. The site itself comprised a former open cast mine where 19 turbines were to be built with tip heights of up to 149 meters. The geological landscape consists of variable sequences of sandstones, siltstones, mudstones, limestones, iron stones and seat rocks. And the geophysical deliverables for each turbine location were in situ measurements of the dynamic shear velocity, uh, shear and Young's modulus. And to integrate geotechnical data in the form of standard penetration tests and borehole lithology into the geophysical models. And then finally, to image the resistivity structure of the ground to five meters below ground level. So in situ measurements of shear and Young's modulus were achieved by collecting MASW data using the ABEM Terralot Pro 2 seismograph and linear arrays of 48 geophones at one meter intervals. Enough length there to provide a continuous 2D profile across each turbine foundation with two orthogonal MASW profiles were collected at each turbine. The typical survey layout is shown on the image to the right where the blue lines denote the MASW profiles. The typical survey layout is shown, yeah, yeah. So the electrical resistivity structure of the ground is determined from Venner arrays collected using the ABEM Terameter LS2, and then to achieve this, linear arrays of 81 electrodes at one meter intervals were employed at each turbine, shown using the red line in the image to the right. And then a borehole was centered at each turbine and that provided geological and SPT, which is standard penetration test data. And these data were used in the seismic modeling. So the results here are shown graphically on the right hand side. This is a one dimensional model of the subsurface. The S wave velocity and standard penetration values were plotted on the horizontal axis. Depth below ground was then on the vertical axis. Okay. So the standard penetration test data are displayed uh, in this case as black dots with zigzags joining them up. 
and then the seismic dispersion data are plotted with the small green dots. And then lastly, the blocky feature is the resulting layered S-wave model derived from joint inversion of the seismic standard penetration test and borehole data. Data were also processed separately without the SPT data to provide purely dynamic estimates of the elastic moduli. And then results were tabulated, as shown below, by uh, exporting the results uh, numerically and then applying simple equations in, in a spreadsheet software to convert from the S-wave velocity into estimates for shear and Young's modulus. So for each linear array, the CMPCC method of MSW was used to derive multiple one-dimensional models uh, along each profile length. And then these were interpolated to create a two-dimensional section. So this was also provided um, to provide some understanding of where ground conditions may vary away from just the central borehole. Um, so one-dimensional and two-dimensional models were provided to the client in this case. So using the Terameter LS2 and Terralock Pro 2, a field team of three were able to collect the required geophysical data at 19 fairly disparate locations over a space of 10 days. The data collected provided dynamic estimates of elastic moduli which is not possible with standard penetration tests alone. And it was possible to undertake a joint inversion of the SPT and MASW data. Two-dimensional arrays provided a greater understanding of the ground conditions across the entire foundational footprint than would be possible with just the one-dimensional measurements available at the borehole locations. So these geophysical methods were more cost-effective than utilizing multiple boreholes per pad foundation, for example. And then we have a, a second short case study. Uh, this one was for rippability. So when the ground needs to be uh, excavated to reach a certain design level, if that excavation cuts into the bedrock, then a method of loosening the rock must be considered. Mechanical ripping is suitable for rocks up to a certain strength. However, the, if the rocks are too hard, then blasting needs to be used. So geophysics is often used method for determining uh, rock properties quickly and in situ, and it can be a useful in the construction planning process to have this information. So this particular site consists of superficial glacial deposits underlain by Devonian and Silurian era sandstones. A new road was proposed that would cut into the bedrock along a route of 1.5 kilometers and an assessment of the mechanical rock properties to design level was, was required for an assessment of rippability. Excavation had already begun, so some of the survey was directly onto bedrock, which is shown in this photo. So data were collected using one meter space geophones. We used a 48 channel array with four meter shot increments. This set produced the minimum and maximum te test depth wing sorry, testing depth of approximately 1.8 meters minimum and 18 meters maximum. And uh, the Terralock Pro 2 seismograph um, is IP66 rated, and that ensured that the survey can be undertaken efficiently despite the fall over. And the project timeline for a team of three to survey this 1.5 kilometer route uh, took five days. The results showed that the S-wave velocity is a variable ranging from around 700 to 1,000 meters per second at the design level. And these velocities are then compared to the published literature to assess the likelihood of rippability. So similar studies produced on S-wave data alone, for example, the one shown, would suggest mostly rippable ground to design level with two borderline areas, which have been highlighted with the blue circles. So a dynamic assessment of ground stiffness to design level was undertaken non-intrusively and rapidly. The cost relative to a comparable intrusive survey is relatively small, and the additional use of the MSW method on site could be, for example, compaction tests to measure the relative improvement 
both during and after construction. And lastly, here's a list of references used in the webinar as further reading from an introductory point. Uh, the masw.com website is very helpful. And following on uh, the 2017 article guidelines for the good practice of surface wave analysis is also very good for some practical advice on many aspects of surface wave investigation. So I want to say thank you again for listening. And if you have any questions, uh, we'll try to answer as many of those as possible now. Uh, if a particularly detailed answer is needed, or if you think of questions after the session, then please contact me directly on my email address, which is in the bottom right of the image. Okay.